and I'm very excited about this speaker who contacted us to tell about his brand new book, which I did have a chance to finish reading and, and I really enjoyed it. So Will McLean Greeley grew up in West Michigan with a passion for American history, politics, and birds. He earned a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Michigan, and then a master's degree from Michigan in archives administration. And after retiring from a 35 year career in government and corporate market research, he embarked upon three years of research and writing to learn about his great, great uncle, George P. McLean and his legacy. Uh, Will is married and the father of two sons and two grandchildren, and he lives in Midland, Michigan. And this book is his very first. And uh, so welcome Will um, Greeley and Will McLean Greeley. And I hope you'll tell all about, start off with um, how you got interested in this uh, in doing this book. I will, thank you, Deborah. And good evening to everybody. And thanks for joining me through this wonderful technology that we had. We're saying probably due to COVID, we've learned how to use this Zoom tool, but it actually is beneficial and it's allowing me to connect with you tonight. And I appreciate that. I began this book in 2018, and that's on the 100th anniversary of the 1918 Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which I assume many of you have heard about. Uh, there was quite a bit of news coverage that year about the 1918 Migratory Bird Treaty Act. One conservationist said that this legislation has saved millions, if not billions of birds from needless killing and quite likely prevented the extinction of many bird species. Uh, other um, writers called this legislation America's first really important environmental legislation. Um, other writers talked about George P. McLean's leadership role in its passage. But for me, it triggered nagging questions and curiosity that I've had about George P. McLean my whole life. My middle name is McLean. And many people in my family over the generations have been named after him as well. But very few people knew much about him. He was a very vague um, personality. Uh, we knew about the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, but, but very little else. And so I determined that I was going to uh, learn more about him, put the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in a broader perspective to understand it more fully and to see how did it fit in to his life story. And so I consulted some 300 sources. Um, and with the assistance of my publisher, the Rochester Institute of Technology Press, I have for you a fascinating story of a life well lived. I want to begin with just a few key themes from my book and theme, themes that I'll be talking about tonight. I'll be talking for probably the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes. And here are some key themes I want you to think about that I'll be further developing. Number one, it's never easy to lead change. Have any of you ever been involved in a leadership role trying to implement an unpopular change? Here's a quote about change. Change hurts. It makes people insecure, confused, and angry. People want things to be the same as they've always been because that makes life easy and comfortable. The second key theme is it takes a special kind of person to lead change. Dictators never work, especially in our culture with democracy. It takes a special person to, to effectively lead change. And a third theme is that Senator George P. McLean was such a special person. He played an indispensable role in establishing lasting legal protections for birds. And that was in the form of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Well, what I'm going to talk about tonight is what made him special. What were the characteristics that he possessed that allowed him to be an effective leader of unpopular change? And I'll be going through three key life experiences that he had that I believe prepared and equipped him to face this monumental challenge that he had to lead passage of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act um, from about 1911 to 1918. It was a seven year struggle in the US Senate and Congress to get this legislation passed. Well, I'd like to um, begin also with some comments about birding. 
Um, I know I'm in the company of other people who love birds. And it said that one out of five people consider themselves to be bird watchers. But I believe that number is understated, especially if we just talk about the number of people who enjoy birds and who care about birds. My wife, for example, is not someone who would call herself a birder, but when we've been out walking and saw um, a bird, I'm trying to advance my PowerPoint here, this bird, you can all see it. Um, this isn't a mystery bird at all to you. This is a scarlet tanager. She's as thrilled as I am to see a scarlet tanager. One of the compensations of getting older is crossing items off your bucket list. And one for me was to go birding in Costa Rica. And it was there that we saw a pair of these um, toucans, something extraordinarily beautiful and almost amusing about this bird. Can you imagine it feeding its young with that very large beak? And then this bird, um, one of the most colorful in North America. I always ask my birding audiences how many have actually seen one of these because it's eluded me in my years of birding. And this is, of course, a painted bunting. Yeah. We were birding in, yes. I, I was uh, just gonna say, we, we, we have them here in Central Florida in the winter. And oh, you're, you're so fortunate. I wanted to see one and it's just not happened for me yet. And when I do, I'm sure I'll be excited. This bird is one we saw in Tucson, Arizona. I didn't take this picture, but this is an elf owl, one of the smallest owls. You get a sense of how small it is. And I think my wife, um, when she saw this bird, she would have taken it home as a pet until I informed her that that would have been a violation of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. She couldn't do that. The other thing that's notable about this picture is the smile on this man's face. Birds really do make us happy. They connect us with nature, their endless variety in terms of their shapes, their sizes, their colors, their songs, their beautiful songs. Um, are, are make us happy just to be in witnessing this, their nesting habits, their migration. And of course, birds can do something that we've always envied, and that is fly. It's human nature to want to protect the things that we care about, the things that we love. And that is fundamentally behind the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. It's protecting something that we, we care about, that we love. But I want you to imagine a time when birds were not protected. And I'm gonna select the year 1911, when George P. McLean was first elected to the US Senate. There was great concern in the United States and probably worldwide about an alarming decline in bird populations. And there's really four factors that went into this decline in bird populations and several high profile extinctions like the passenger pigeon around this time. The first cause of this problem was that birds were hunted as a food source. And that's been happening since the beginning of time. They're a cheap source of protein. But secondly, birds began to be hunted as a fashion accessory for women's hats primarily, but not exclusively. But primarily women's hats were adorned with these bird feathers uh, and that put pressure on bird populations. But the third factor was the increase in population a population explosion really after the American Civil War. The population in the US in 1860 was 31 million people, about the size of the state of Florida. But by 1900, that number had more than doubled to 72 million. And a third of that growth came from immigration. So there were simply more mouths to feed, more heads to put hats on, and people went out to hunt birds in, in, in excessive numbers. But the most critical factor, this fourth factor that led to this dangerously high level of hunting of birds was the advent of the automatic or pump shotgun. And that happened around 1890. And so individual hunters became killing machines. The numbers of birds hunted went from hundreds of thousands per year to millions, to tens of millions and ever higher. And by 1911, this hunting had reached epic and, and dangerous proportions. But here's the thing, there was no easy solution to stop or even slow this hunting because every state 
was able and free to set their own hunting laws and enforce them however they wished. And to make the situation even more pernicious, as the uh, population of birds declined, the price of birds went up, which of course encouraged more hunting. So this is the situation that George P. McLean uh, was presented with when he was elected to the U.S. Senate in 1911. Extinctions like the passenger pigeon, the Carolina parakeet, the heath hen, and near extinctions of birds that like the snowy egret, the wood duck, the trumpeter swan, the, tr uh, the whooping crane, and many others. Um, these were on the verge of extinction. So this is why the, it was so important to try to address this problem of excessive hunting but as I said, there was no easy solution to this problem. Um, um, the, for most of us, the MBTA is just a footnote. We don't know much about it. Uh, for some people, it's a full-time job to understand its complexity. But the goal of my book is to put a personal face on the MBTA. I want you to become acquainted with the person who is most responsible for its passage, and to get have you get a sense of the significant struggle that he and others went through to get this passed. Um, one of the people, this is my only slide with text on it, but I got the um, endorsement of my book from David Allen Sibley, which was very meaningful to me, and it, uh, I, I so much appreciate um, his endorsement. And I wanted to uh, show some quotes uh, from uh, Sibley's review because I think it captures the heart of my book. Um, on one level, this is a fascinating and, and thoroughly researched glimpse into the workings of politics of the 20th century. I talk about the intersection of culture and birds and how the two collided uh, to create this excessive hunting. On another level, it's an inspiring story about a man's determination and steadfast commitment to securing legal protection for birds. I'm glad to know more about George P. McLean. So my book traces George P. McLean's rise from obscurity as a Connecticut farm boy to national prominence when he came to know seven U.S. presidents and spent 13 years in the U.S. Senate. And what I want to do this evening is describe to you three key life experiences that he had that prepared and equipped him for this struggle that lay ahead in his future of passing the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. The first struggle, um, the first life experience, excuse me, that he had was emerging from uh, a boyhood growing up on a farm in rural Connecticut to um, a career in the law. McLean was born in 1857 on a, on a subsistence farm in rural Connecticut. His mother made much of his clothing and when he arrived at Hartford Public High School in 1872, he was bullied for the clothing that he wore. It was made from wool and flax and linen and, and products grown in, in, uh, on their farm. But over time, he won the respect of many of his antagonists who came to regard him as the brainiest member of their class. They named him class orator and school editor, honors that recognize his exceptional public speaking and writing ability. So his first job was as a newspaper reporter, and it was there that he made some very critical connections covering uh, influential politicians in Hartford, Connecticut. And they saw in McLean a very able, ambitious, personable young man with a promising future in politics. So they mentored him, and they first encouraged him to study the law. And so he studied as an apprentice. He didn't go to law school. Many people didn't at that time. And he um, apprenticed with a very well-known lawyer um, who did a lot of work for the New Haven Railroad and other corporate clients in, in Connecticut. And he spent six years with them. And after that, he was named to a commission to revise all the general statutes of Connecticut. Well, why was that important? Because I think it really deepened his knowledge of the lawmaking process. He was thoroughly acquainted with all of the laws of Connecticut, revising them, putting them into those law books and codifying that so all the lawyers would be able to access the laws of the state. 
And this was a three-year project that he went on to really get a deeper understanding of the law. And then in 1892, he was named U.S. Attorney for Connecticut by then President Benjamin Harrison. So he was the chief prosecuting attorney for the state of Connecticut for four years, starting in 1892. And I talk a little bit about the high profile cases that he had as a prosecuting attorney. But this all deepened and increased his understanding of the law. In 1896, he started his own law firm. And this was in the Aetna Insurance Company building. That was his primary uh, client, the Aetna Insurance Company. But he had a couple of other high-profile uh, clients, the New Haven Railroad. This was the time when smaller railroads were being absorbed into regional and national lines. And he had another client, a startup called American Telephone and Telegraph. This was the era when telephones were just being proliferated into um, homes. So they were setting up telephone poles and the wiring, and there was a great deal of legal work that went into getting the right-of-ways for this, and some criminal work, because some people didn't like these telephone poles in their front yards, and so they would chop them down with axes, and he had to help prosecute some of this. This gives new meaning to that phrase, not in my backyard, not in my front yard. So AT&T was one of his, his main clients. And so McLean's knowledge of the law deepened over these different experiences, having his own law firm, um, having being a prosecuting attorney. But the second key life experience that prepared and equipped McLean to eventually pass and oversee passage of the MBTA was his experience as a politician, as a reform-minded political leader. He was elected in... Um, at the age of 25 to the Connecticut legislature. One of the youngest members of that body, they were average age of around 40. And he soon picked up on a very corrupt issue in Connecticut at that time of how pardons were granted to the imprisoned. Um, it was a very corrupt practice. It was in the hands of the legislature and they held these uh, kangaroo court-like, circus-like um, hearings um, for people to come plead their case to get a pardon. Well, there was bribery associated with many of these cases. There was favor trading in order to secure a pardon. So McLean instituted a reform proposal that resulted in the creation of something called the Connecticut Board of Pardons that put the pardon making process into a panel of nine people, including the governor, several Supreme Court justices, some professional people like doctors and uh, lay people to oversee the pardoning process. And this was a significant achievement for him in his early 20s and put him on the political map in the state because this was a very needed change and one that he very courageously and creatively uh, helped pass. Well, he held a number of other uh, positions in government in his 30s, but these were all stepping stones to the summit of his early career. And that was to run for governor of Connecticut. And he was elected at age 43 um, to a governor of Connecticut. And in his inaugural address as governor, he outlined an ambitious reform plan that consisted of four main goals that surprised many people, especially these mentors that had nurtured his career along. They didn't know that he had this strong desire to reform uh, the state of Connecticut as governor. A couple of the reforms were, one was women's suffrage, but just as at the local and municipal level, it was like an experiment in the year of 1900 when he was elected to um, begin this process of women's suffrage. Secondly, he advocated free textbooks for public school students. Both those proposals were strongly opposed and were never passed. Then he had a, some tax reform on moneyed corporations. These were uh, taxes on insurance companies and banks that had a lower tax level because most taxes were calculated on heavy plant and equipment. Well, this was a very unpopular reform amongst his mentors and leaders of his party, the Republican Party, who resisted this reform. But his major reform was to, re was to change the system of representation in the Connecticut legislature. And I want you to stay with me on this because it sounds maybe a little obscure on the surface, but it was a very important change. The system of representation in the Connecticut House of Representatives was based on every town and city sent two representatives 
to the legislature, regardless of population. So the smallest city in Connecticut, Union, Connecticut, with only 400 people, had two representatives. The lar one of the largest cities, New Haven, with over 100,000 people, had two representatives. It was not proportional by population. And in effect, this disenfranchised these large growing cities that were populated by immigrants primarily that were streaming into Connecticut during this time. And the, the political leaders wanted to maintain this town system and deprive these larger cities of representation in the legislature. And this was important for many reasons, not the least of which was that U.S. senators were elected by state legislators until um, 1913. So to have the power of the legislature, they could choose who went to the U.S. Senate as well as control legislation. In effect, the legislature was a, was a, a social club. It wasn't a representative government body at all. And so McLean wanted to change the system of representation to reflect the different levels of population of Connecticut's towns and cities. Well, this was a tremendous th threat to the status quo. And the leaders of his own party began to turn on him and to fight in a very bitter manner any of his changes. And so the last year of his being governor, it was a two-year term, was extremely um, contentious and filled with adversity as they meant to stop any of his reforms, particularly this one that changed the system of representation. And he tried a number of compromise solutions, but in the end, he was defeated. And this took a great toll on him personally, emotionally, physically. He was burned out and he was exhausted. And all of this sent him into a paralyzing depression. And this is the third key life experience I want to share with you that I think shaped his life and his ability to be a leader of change in the future. And that was this period of defeat and exile. The leaders of his own party turned on him and put him into political exile for eight years following his unsuccessful term as a reform governor. His weight fell to about 125 pounds, uh, normally 160. He said in later years, it took him almost seven years to regain his mental health after he left the governor's office. So this was a period of, of reassessment and regrouping and getting his mental health back. So for eight years, he was out of the public eye. Well, a number of important things happened though during this eight year period. He, um, in 1906, McLean was already wealthy from this law practice that he had. He inherited $3 million from his father's sister, who was a wealthy widow from New York City. Now, $3 million in 1906 is equivalent to almost $90 million today. So he was an extremely wealthy man uh, beginning around 1906. In 1907, he married for the first time. Uh, he married uh, a longtime companion, uh, Juliet Goodrich, and the two loved to travel together. They enjoyed their growing estate. McLean was buying up hundreds of acres of land around his boyhood farm. And so now he is at a decided crossroads in his life. And I, I want to emphasize how important this time was. He's a man who was immensely wealthy. Politics had dealt him a bitter blow. He tried to come back in 1905 to run for the Senate that was unsuccessful because his party leaders blocked his efforts. Perhaps it was time to retire. He had the means. Um, he had uh, a new life. He had his domestic life is settled. But instead, McLean um, charted a way back and ran for the U.S. Senate for the second time successfully in 1911 and was elected to, to the U.S. Senate for his first of three terms, serving in the Senate from 1911 to 1929. So this brings me really to the heart of my book, and that is his struggle to pass the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. This was a seven-year struggle for McLean and others, and they faced staunch opposition from hunting groups, um, business interests, and states' rights advocates. Now, the hunters were those who hunted birds for food to feed this growing population that I mentioned, and also those uh, who hunted birds for the hat industry. In 1910, there were over 128,000 people employed in making hats. Uh, and this was a career that was open for many women. 
entrepreneurs. So in some ways, this, they were responding to fads and fashions, and there was this tremendous demand for bird feathers. But it wasn't just women's fashion. McLean decried on the Senate floor a man's coat that was selling for $10,000 in 1911 that was made out of hummingbird skins. Hundreds of hummingbirds were killed to make this technicolor dream coat. And this was totally legal because every state was free to set its own standards on uh, hunting of birds. And so McLean wanted to create federal legislation that would impose standards on the states. And this is where the greatest opposition came to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act from the state's rights advocates. They argued very compellingly that the the, the federal government lacked the constitutional authority to intervene in areas that were reserved for the state governments. So this was at the crux of the problem for McLean and others to pass the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And this is where I go back to these life experiences that he had as a lawyer, his deep knowledge of the law from these different perspectives as a legislator, as a lawyer, as a prosecuting attorney. He was able to help uh, change and influence the nature of this legislation over a seven-year period, which changed significantly to meet these uh, objections, particularly these constitutional objections. And this is really the heart of why this achievement was so significant, was to overcome these states' rights objections. Now, I want to recap these three life events and comment on how I think they add reader interest for you. The first was his emergence as, as a lawyer um, out of obscurity. I think there's something inherently interesting about seeing how someone moves from absolute anonymity as a Connecticut farm boy to eventual national notoriety. It's the American dream writ large. I mean, who doesn't like a rags to riches story? That's a, a good part of the early narrative of my book. The second life experience was his um, being a reform leader at various stages in his life. He lived during a time of massive change of industrialization from a country that was largely rural to one that was primarily urban. And there was a tremendous growth in income and wealth. But at the same time, this all this change was very destabilizing. And there were a number of social, economic, political, and environmental problems that resulted from this runaway growth that occurred after the American Civil War. This was truly the best of times and the worst of times. McLean lived during three presidential assassinations. He was seven years old when Abraham Lincoln was killed. Um, he was 24 when James Garfield was assassinated and 44 years old when William McKinley was assassinated. There was a sense that the political anarchy and uh, with un instability was rampant in society. And McLean was one of those figures who sought to bring order out of chaos. And then the third life challenge that McLean had was his period of defeat and exile. On le one level, this is an inspiring story of how an individual learned from his mistakes, his failures, and came out of a very dark period in his life to perhaps his most fruitful. Who doesn't like a comeback story? Well, that too is a part of my narrative in this book. As I wrap up my remarks, I want to talk a little bit about McLean's legacy. I've already said that the MBTA has saved millions, if not billions of birds from senseless killing and likely prevented the extinction of many bird species. This is significant in and of itself, but there are a couple of other dimensions to this achievement that I want to highlight tonight. First of all, this was foundational law. It was precedent setting legislation that paved the way for the federal government to intervene in other areas relating to conservation and the environment. So in later years, you had the Bald Eagle Act of the 1930s that put special protections on our national symbol, the Endangered Species Act of the 70s, the Animal Welfare Act, perhaps even the Environmental Protection Act itself, is a, these are all many ways byproducts of the MBTA because it paved the way for the federal government to impose national standards on the states and enforce them. Another dimension to McLean's legacy is the global nature of this achievement. You see, at the heart of the MBTA are a series of treaties negotiated 
between and among nations that assure the preservation of birds wherever they are in their migratory cycle. The first version of this bird protection legislation only pertained to the United States, and that would have fallen far, far short of this global migratory bird treaty act that was eventually um, signed in 1918. And this is really the genius of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, these treaties, and it explains why it has lasted 100 years and will probably for another 100 years because of its global scope. We all know birds migrate. They're not respecters of national boundaries. I'm going to close with a question that was once asked about another famous George, and that question is this. What would the world have been like if George P. McLean had never been born? And you probably know who that other famous George was that question was asked about. And that is, of course, George Bailey from It's a Wonderful Life. If George P. McLean had never been born, I believe that eventually some form of bird protection legislation would have been passed. But the question is when and to what extent? McLean possessed a number of key characteristics uh, for a good leader of change. And these were things born out of his experiences. First, he was able to communicate urgency and vision and brought to the attention of the U.S. Senate and Congress the plight of birds. A good leader needs to uh, st send out the alarm and to bring attention to the need for change. And McLean did that. His maiden speech in the Senate in 1911 was on the subject of uh, migratory bird protection. Secondly, a good leader of change needs to know how to overcome obstacles that inevitably come up when you're trying to solve problems. McLean showed great flexibility and adaptability as this legislation morphed over a seven year time period that ultimately resulted in the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. A third characteristic of a good leader is they're able to build coalitions. Change starts very small with just a few people, but ultimately it needs critical mass and you need to bring others to create um, the significant size of, of, of a base of change. And McLean did this. He had these publicized hearings um, that brought Audubon groups and other conservationists, business leaders, uh, Henry Ford was one of them, um, also gun manufacturers. He brought them on board to um, get support for the MBTA. But the greatest example of him creating a coalition to pass this legislation is working with uh, President Woodrow Wilson, who was from the opposite political party. He was a Democrat and McLean a Republican, but the two worked together to assure passage of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. It was signed on July 3rd, 1918, when the U.S. was at its peak participation in World War I. There was also a global flu pandemic. The country was facing tremendous social and political instability because of this unpopular war. And McLean's opponents had argued that once the war started, that, that the Migratory Bird Treaty should be put on hold indefinitely. But he, working with Woodrow Wilson, pushed through these final obstacles and barriers that were put up by his opponents and ensured that the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was signed despite these obstacles and world war and, and a flu pandemic, et cetera. I believe the window was closing on reform around 1918. For those of you who know about the progressive era, it's called, it ended after World War I and was replaced by the Roaring Twenties when people lived for normalcy and peace and prosperity and there was a very limited role for the federal government. So it's very possible that had the Migratory Bird Treaty Act not been passed in 1918, it could have been um, further neglected throughout the Roaring Twenties, this time of peace and prosperity and isolationism. And that was followed by the 1930s and the Great Depression. And one could imagine that, again, bird protection legislation would have taken second uh, consideration and priority to this national economic emergency. So in closing, I believe that the world is a better place because George P. McLean didn't quit after that very turbulent time as an unsuccessful governor leading change in Connecticut. But he, he came back and went to the U.S. Senate. And along with many others, he helped stop the killing 
of some of God's most beautiful creations and put in place lasting legal protections for birds that we still benefit from and enjoy today. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. That was wonderful. Okay, let's see what questions people have. And if not, I've, I've got a few. <laughs> You can unmute and speak them or, oh yes, Carol. Carol is a chapter president um, and I, I trust she'll be in contact with you. Um, well, I wanted to ask when he um, didn't run again for governor and that was a really rough period, how long did it take for the system of representation to change in Connecticut and elsewhere? That's a great question, Deborah. 1965. The system of representation did not change in Connecticut until 1965. This was so deeply rooted in the culture of Connecticut. This idea of the small rural towns having uh, control over the legislature uh, lasted that long, and it only changed because the U.S. Supreme Court mandated it. There were other state legislatures that were in need of reform as well. I think Connecticut's was probably the most egregious in the sense that you had this system of representation. Um, and really it was in many ways an, an anti-immigrant stance that was playing out in the form of representation. Oh. The, the, the older generations in, in Connecticut um, wanted to minimize the level of participation for these new immigrant groups that were teaming into Connecticut's industrializing cities. And that was really, I think, at the heart of this. And McLean showed, I think, great courage in showing a willingness to bring those people, uh, you know, the immigrant groups, the, the larger cities, into the political process. And I think this was really to his credit that he had that vision and wanted to introduce representation and, uh, and democracy into the state government. And what about other states? You know, the U.S. Supreme Court decision came about, um, it was called the one person, one vote rule. And it came up about in this time period of 1965. And it, it was a, a bigger problem also in the South because there were ways that the that, that Southern state legislatures were gerrymandered and restricted the involvement of, uh, of African-Americans and others. And so what was created was a system that was for every state that they had to adhere to of one person, one vote. And it really created representative democracy for state legislatures across the, the country. Um, because of the Supreme Court case. I'm glad you picked up on that because some people think that's kind of an obscure issue. And yet it's so important to understand because he fought for this reform unsuccessfully and he faced these very bitter attacks. And it was this and the other agenda items of his reform that sent him into this depression. Yeah, and he also had presidential aspirations. Yes. Um, and I think he saw them slipping away, that it was his time to shine on the national stage as, as a governor. And he not only was um, unsuccessful, but he was marginalized by the leaders of his own party who really wanted him to be washed up and finished. And I think, um, and he had a very high temperament, a very tense, in, intense in temperament as well that contributed to this very significant breakdown. I found it interesting that he, he he found himself better suited for being in the Senate, which is more of a team thing, r r rather than being the administrator as governor or perhaps president. Yeah, I think we see that in history that many of our better presidents have been governors. You know, it's an executive function and senators. Um, it's what do they call that the world's greatest deliberative body. It's a very studious, more environment. And I think that was better suited for him. But one thing about this man is he was intensely ambitious. And in the early stage of his life, uh, I really believe he was, he said so. He was devoted. He really wanted to become president of the United States. And 
this was a goal that just eluded him. And I think it uh, created a real crisis in his identity. Uh, and it took him many years to come back. Um, I, I hope you saw it in my book that he got involved in mental health reform, though, during this eight year period where he was out of the public eye. He helped put together the, a, a professional association that is now called Mental Health America, creating professional standards for the care of the mentally ill. Um, and he was the first president of this organization. So it's another indication of that he was always try trying to solve problems and not just perpetuate them. And I admire that about him. So as you wrote it and reviewed your knowledge of the presidents of this period, was there any president that you found particularly fascinating that you hadn't known about? <clears throat> yeah. Um, I think that um, one of the more underappreciated presidents was William McKinley, who was a role model for McLean in the sense that McKinley wanted to broaden the base of the Republican Party at that time uh, to involve more immigrants and more laboring people, as opposed to the older um, generations of Republican leaders. And McLean admired McKinley tremendously. Um, but you can't help but love Theodore Roosevelt, you know, and, and um, Theodore Roosevelt was a close personal friend of McLean. They went hunting and fishing together. Um, I found some interviews. Uh, McLean, as I took, was a wealthy man and he had a chauffeur. And I found an interview with his chauffeur who loved Theodore Roosevelt, just said they, they don't make people like that anymore. And I think uh, Roosevelt was also very influential in McLean because they were both conservationists. They were both dedicated to reform and they were very willing to push the older generation of Republican leaders to the background in favor of what they viewed as the role of the Republican party. And that was to be leading reform uh, in the nation. I think we have to let go of some of our labels about re Democrats versus Republicans when we go back a hundred years. Mm -hmm. The Republican Party was the party of reform during this era, led by Theodore Roosevelt and others. And McLean was certainly one of these reformers. And this is hard for many of us to think this way because some of this is is, is all been reversed or in many of our perceptions it has. But um, that's one of the things I hope people will go to the book with an open mind to learn about a period of time that many of us don't know a lot about. And I said to you, Deborah, earlier that uh, many of us know a lot about the Civil War. You know, Ken Burns had that wonderful series in the Civil War. We tend to fast forward to World War II and we skip over this block of time, almost 75 years of not knowing much about World War I, for example. Um, not knowing much about this period of reform where leaders um, had to fight for many basic changes in representational democracy and other reforms that McLean helped contribute to. Yes. Um, so back to birds, since uh, this is a bird audience, um, when did the passenger pigeon get go extinct? In uh, 1914, um, I, I have a feature article prepared on this, so I know it was September the 1st, 1914, and they can date it that precisely because the last passenger pigeon was in captivity in the Cincinnati Zoo. And this was a real death watch that the nation um, observed mainly through the, the newspaper, pre the press, because um, there was this mad attempt to find another passenger pigeon to somehow bring this species back. But at one time, there were three to five billion passenger pigeons in North America. Many of you probably know the plight of the passenger pigeon. Um, but it's it went extinct over a long period of time, but people knew this was going to happen. But the last one was 1914, but they were virtually absent from the skies for probably a decade, and they had been ubiquitous. I mean, it, it took, sometimes it was 75 miles of passenger pigeons migrating over a city, and it would blot out the sun, I and mean, it was that prevalent. But they were easy to hunt, they were uh, very, very flavorful, and people 
wanted a cheap uh, form of protein, and this was a very readily available bird. I mean, this was a rational activity to hunt these birds because the American diet at that time was very limited. It was basically red meat. The, the, the chicken industry, as we know it today, didn't come into until the 1920s, and refrigeration was not uh, advanced at all. So this idea of, of, of getting fresh meat, uh, the passenger pigeon and other birds. Uh, how about robin pies? I mean, people were killing birds um, and just making, uh, you know, they were using them as a, a source of protein um, in as they moved west. And uh, this was a rational activity. And until there were laws to prevent it, I mean, people were free to do it. Mm -hmm. In some ways, I try not to demonize the hunters, both the, um, the hunters for feathers and for food, because these were poor people that were moving west and they needed to survive. And they, the idea of hunting was very acceptable. And to get paid money to hunt birds for their plumage, it made sense. I mean, it was a way for you to make a living. And as I said, one of the things that made me even more sympathetic was to see that this was a, a road for many women entrepreneurs to become hat makers in big cities primarily. And they depended on this plumage trade to make these hats that were in such high demand. Mm -hmm. So I try not to demonize these people um, because they were responding to the need to survive, and these were legal activities. But this was one of the reasons why it was such a difficult struggle, because it was so acceptable to hunt for these purposes, and people really resisted it. Um, and it's um, it took a lot of forbearance to lead that change. I asked the question, have any of you tried to lead change in a job you had, a volunteer group or a nonprofit? It is hard to do, and you take a lot of of, uh, of arrows and uh, abuse, and it's a thankless job in some ways. And it takes a special kind of person to persevere. And I, I, I hope that by reading my book, you'll sense that that he had this ability to lead change because of a lot of negative experiences he had that strengthened and prepared him to lead this this important fight that lay ahead in his life. Very interesting. Susan, do you see any more questions? I don't see any more in the chat. I think. No. Well, oh, sorry. You, you know what? We, we need to tell how people could buy the book. Is it going to be sold like on Amazon or anything? Yes, um, it is available in two primary ways. Um, my publisher, the Rochester Institute of Technology Press, um, it's available through their website. Um, it is also available um, through Amazon. And that's probably, um, you know, the easiest way to, to get the book. Um, and um, there's free shipping and it's... Um, if, if, if any of you would like a discounted copy when I have... Um, personal appearances, I always have um, a bird, a, a book signing mm -hmm. and I discount it. Um, the publisher priced it at $34.95, which was a little higher than I wanted, but um, I would be happy to send you a copy um, for $30 um, with and that would include shipping. So somehow you can get my email through Deborah and, and I'd be happy to um, fulfill that um, for you, you know, if you'd like to get a book that way. And I'll even okay. sign it if that's uh <laughs> yes. If okay. You'd like very, that. Very nice. I'm gonna pop the email into the uh chat and we'll find another way as well to to distribute your, your email and mention the book again in another in an email later. So here I'll just copy it right now. Let's see. But um otherwise, there it is. Um this has been really, really interesting. And uh, I, thanks everybody for staying with it. And um, yeah, very, very interesting story. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate those of you who 
wanted to learn more about the MBTA. And as I said, I think it's a footnote for many people. And I, with, after reading my book, I think you'll deepen your appreciation for the need for this and for the significant struggle that went on. And we always talk about that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, I think we take for granted the MBTA, um, that it's there, and but it wasn't always. And it took people like George P. McLean and many others. It wasn't a single-handed accomplishment, but it took many people who came before us to uh, put this very important legislation in place. And um, sometimes it's good to just uh, take that bigger view and appreciate what others have done before us. But thank you very much for inviting me here tonight. And um, we're, we're all bird lovers at heart. And um, I hope this book will increase your, your love for birds and for others who love them. Hey, thanks very much. It was a great job. Congratulations on the book. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate it. I wish we could have gotten to know each other a little bit better, but um, Zoom is better than nothing. And um, it's nice to be um, interacting with other bird lovers and Thanks again for inviting me tonight. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Good night. Good night, everybody.